I never know how to take his introductions because they always sound like eulogies. But, uh, but uh, uh, he's, I, I was like thinking last year when we had uh, the third annual sitting in the sukkah, uh, Hoshana Rabbah evening learning, and uh, there were five of us. Myself, Rabbi Furman, Sheila Furman, and Yossi, who else? <laughs> sitting in the rain. So I, I must say that, uh, as usual, our Samer Savoy is growing, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be back here. In, in the tells us, the Torah tells us, that we're supposed to sit in the sukkah for seven days. And it gives us a reason. And the reason it says is, Ki basukas or shafti es Yisrael. Hashem tells us that we have to sit in the sukkah for seven days because He placed us, He placed the Jewish nation, Laman Yehidu so that all of your generation should know, Ki basukas or shafti es Yisrael. All the generations should know that at one point in history, Hashem took us out of Egypt and He put us in sukkahs. Therefore, we have a mitzvah of sukkah. That's what it's That's the reason. Yet if we examine this, it seems strange because God did a lot of miracles for us. And we don't have a holiday for every miracle. God took us out of Egypt and God split the sea and God gave us the mun, He gave us the manna and, he, and we had the water, the well. And it seems strange that why pick specifically on the one, this one thing that He took us out and so it's a machlokas, it's a question, what does it mean that He put us in a sukkah itself that literally we had to live in shacks? Or it means that he surrounded us by the clouds of glory, by the Anani Yaakovot. And that's a question. But even if we, it means shacks, obviously the, the Anani Yaakovot, the clouds of glory, were included in this. But the question that the Nesiva Shalom asks, and uh, should bother all of us, why specifically this? Why, not, why don't we have a holiday for every miracle that happened for us? You imagine, this is something that happened, took us out and in Egypt, from Egypt, here we are sitting in the desert, surrounded by the clouds of glory. It was a fantastic thing. But so was the man. Every day you wake up, you go out, then you get your, your man from the field, you eat it, no problem. No water in the middle of the desert, no problem, we'll take care of that. Here's a little bit of water for you. Why do we have a mitzvah like this? If we understand why we have mitzvahs, to really understand why they are, and the Torah tells us, that so that all your generations should know. It tells us that the same way that it was 100% applicable 3,300 years ago, that they had no question that they had a certain amount of gratitude to Hashem because of this tremendous miracle that He did for them. That has to be the exact same feeling that we have now. It means that the mitzvah that we're relating to has to be something that we feel in the same intensity as it felt back then. Because otherwise there would be no reason for it. When we say we remember the things that Hashem did for us, we remember the miracles that He did for us. We don't remember them in the same way that you know you go to Kruger National Park and you take, a, uh, you take pictures of what you see and you bring back an elephant head and you have all these souvenirs. What a souvenir does, what, an, what, a, what, a, what a picture does, a photograph does, is it helps you remember that nice feeling that you had before. And it makes that feeling a little bit more tangible. But that was the past and this is a present. And at any point that I, I want to go back to the past, I could just look at this I could just look at this picture. That's why we have souvenirs. That's what they do for us. The mitzvahs. When Hashem tells us we have a mitzvah because we're supposed to remember it. And over here, even more than remember it. So that we should know it. We should understand it. It's not telling us so that you should try to think what it felt like. You should have like a nice memory of leaving out Egypt. Here you are. We had this nice lifestyle in Egypt. And all of a sudden we come out and we're having a jaw out in the desert. Right? With all the snakes and the scorpions. And we have nothing to eat and we have nothing to drink. All these pleasant memories. Right? These are the things that we're supposed to be remembering. It's not that we're supposed to bring ourselves back to the past. But rather the emphasis is on the present. In order to understand that every generation has the same feeling because every generation is capable of experiencing that exact same feeling and capable of experiencing and does experience the exact same miracle that had happened to the people when they left 3,300 years ago. This doesn't only apply to the mitzvahs in, in, uh, of, of sukkah. It applies to all the mitzvahs. All the mitzvahs when we have, for example, Pesach, Shavuos, it says, It's our time of freedom. 
Is it talking about that we were taken out of Egypt? This is very far away from us. You're talking about generations and generations, 3,300 years ago. We're living in a Western society. We're living in society. We have everything wonderful. What's the point of remembering what it was like back then? Not only what's the point, but it seems like it's a very difficult thing for us to do. To actually try to concentrate and visualize what it's like to be a slave. You know, we have clothing, we have food, we have a house. It's, it's very far-fetched from us. And yet we see what the Torah, we see what our Chazal tell us. Is that, on the one hand, yes, it's remembering that tremendous miracle that happened when Hashem took us out of Egypt. But on the other hand, it's telling us something that's very relevant to our lives. It's telling us something that's very personal to ourselves. That every single one of our, us have our own personal Egypts. Every single one of us have our own personal constraints, our borders, our boundaries, the things that we're not able to get out of. And on Pesach is a special time that not just we remember it, but Kabbalistically it tells us that there's a special energy, there's an influence, a flow from, from heaven that comes down and helps us tap into that and take advantage of it. Take advantage of that, of that miracle that helps us step outside of our lives, step outside of our complacency, out of our, out of our constraints, out of our Yetzirah, and have Zman Cheresim, have our time of freedom. The same thing applies for Shavuos. The same thing applies for Matan Torah, for the giving of the Torah. We say every day, thank you Hashem Hashem, no salon Torah Zemes, that you gave it to us, Baruch Atah Hashem, no sena Torah. Thank you Hashem, no sena Torah, you, the one who gives us the Torah. It should have said, Baruch Atah Hashem, no sena Torah. Thank you again Hashem, for the fact that you gave us the Torah. How come it says, no sena Torah? So the Sfasemes explains that no sena Torah means that Hashem is constantly giving us His Torah. Every single person has the ability of having their own Matan Torah, their own Kabbalah Satorah, their own acceptance of the Torah. There are certain times during the year that we have to tap into these things. Certain times that that energy is, is just w waiting for us to grab onto it. Because of that, why specifically the mitzvah of Sukkah has to do with Anani HaKavad? How come it has to do with something? that happened so long ago and how come it has to do with that thing that doesn't, that, as opposed to any other miracle like the mon, uh, like the water, like the well answers in the Siva Shalom is that there's two types of, of miracles that happen there's miracles that happen that need to happen at this point in time based on our circumstances for example, they were in the desert, they didn't have anything to eat, right? They weren't capable of getting anything to eat because there was no animals in the desert. So what did they do? Hashem made a special miracle that applied at that time, and that miracle was that they were able to have money. They were able to go out every day and get something to eat. But that was for that generation. That was based on their needs. The water was the same thing. The splitting of the sea was the same thing. It was based on their needs and those times. Anane covered the clouds of glory, the sitting in the sukkah, is something that is not, wasn't just based on their needs. It's based on their needs and it has to do with our needs also. The, the emphasis of it, the idea that we learn from it, and the everyday thought and the everyday interaction that we have with Hashem is very, very much relevant to us in terms of what these clouds of glory were. What did they do for us? We went into the desert. It's a dangerous place. Hashem looks back on us and He says, Hashem says, look at that, I remember this, this kindness that in your youth that you did for me, that the Jewish nation did to me. The love of my, of my kawa, the love of my bride. Left, what was that? The greatest love, this, this tremendous compliment that he pays to us. The greatest compliment is that you followed me into a desert, into a place that had, there was nothing planting, there was nothing that you could eat over there. That we followed Hashem. There was a certain amount of emunah, there was a certain amount of faith that we had in Hashem, and we followed Hashem into there. That's what the Bnei Yisrael did. It's true that Hashem protected us, and it's true that He took us out of Egypt. But you see that four-fifths of the Jewish nation died out in Egypt. Four-fifths of the Jewish nation weren't on the level of really putting their emuna into action. Making that trust in Hashem something that they're going to be able to live by. And they remained within those borders, within those boundaries. They weren't able to leave there. The rest of the Jewish nation came out. And they followed Hashem into a desert. You had a man, Naksum ben Aminadab. When they're standing here, you had the sea. Over here, you had the Egyptians on the other side coming to get them. 
How many to kill them? What did he do? He started walking. He says, Hashem says it's going to be okay. No problem. I trust you. It's going to be okay. And he starts walking and he's walking and he's walking and he gets up to his knees, to his waist, to his chest. Gets up to his neck, up to here. He's about to drown. Can't go any further without drowning. And all of a sudden the sea splits. It took a certain amount of courage. It took a certain amount of saying, I'm not just paying lip service to my feelings. I'm showing what I, you know, I walk the, I talk the talk and I walk the walk. We're feeling it. That's what, that's what the emotions that we have. That's what the emuna that we have over here is. That none are covered. The clouds of glory was something that is very, very much relevant to our days. In the same way that it taught us emuna back there. It taught us that no matter who tries to attack us, no matter whether it's, it's nature that tries to attack us, no matter it's the fact that we're not able, we don't have food, no matter if it's, if it's the, 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 we're at the mercy of the elements, or at the mercy of everybody else who tries to attack us, we know that I have the clouds of glory and the pillar of fire that's going to protect us. Hashem literally came down Himself and protected us. He, he said, you're my kala, you're my loved one. I'm going to protect you. That's my responsibility. And that's what He did for us. For us today, this happens so many times. Our entire lives, we, we view them, we, try, we tend to view them. Very small in the sense, as Rabbi Firman puts it, pettiness. That the way that we lead our lives. We have God over there and we have our, our business over here. We have God over there and we have our little lives over here. Yet in reality, the, what, the, what the Anani HaKavad, what Sukkah is trying to teach us, is that there's so much more to it. This Hashem is involved in our everyday lives to a tremendous amount and we don't even know it half the time. I have to tell you two stories. One of them, if you're familiar, um, I think it was four years ago, and Hanukkah came out, is that uh, there was these Arabs who were driving and they got in a car accident. Somebody called the police and the police came and they, they found in the car, the car was, was full of explosives and weapons and they found an entire layout of the Itri Yeshiva which is, which is in the, the, which is, uh, it's in the Shtachim. It's, uh, it's right next to Tal Piyot. But it's an Arabs around the neighborhood it's, uh, and it's a Yeshiva over the Yeshiva Katan, it's a primary school. And these, these Arabs were, were going and they were trying to, they were going to attack the school and wipe out the whole school. What happened? They got in a car accident. Now, how many, we happened, like, because of the media, we happened to find out about it. How many times do these things happen that we don't know when it's about to happen? The, it says that it says that Hashem that, that that all the nations of the world will understand the power of Hashem. How will they understand the power of Hashem? Because every time they try to do something, something happens and it doesn't work out. So they understand it in a sense better than we understand it. Last year, while living in Savoy, we uh, we in the middle of the night, I get a phone call from the 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 armed uh, response. And they want to know is everything okay? So I'm like. I guess everything is okay, you know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, everything should be okay. I didn't hear, I didn't hear a siren, nothing. We have an alarm system, of course. So, um, so, so, but I look out the window, and the house that we were at had a, had a, sen a sensor light, which meant in order for it to go on, somebody has to walk in front of it. And here it is, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I look out the window, and the sensor light is on. So it means that there must have been somebody there. So I say, you know, it's better come and check it out. Turns out, right, they come, there have been people there that are trying to get into the house, they couldn't get into the house, they got into the garage, they jumped over the fence, unfortunately at that time I didn't have my fortress like I have now with barbed wire and electric and this and that, but they got away. They got scared away by this armed response. But I couldn't figure out why was it that, that they called me at this time, because alarm didn't go off. So it turns out that three days beforehand, somebody had unplugged the alarm system to, to plug in a vacuum cleaner. And uh, they forgot to plug it back in. And has a backup battery. Three days later, the backup battery, at three o'clock in the morning, at the exact time that there were people who were trying to break into the house, runs out and sets off the alarm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you don't have to look any farther. I mean, it's, it's all right there before us. That's what that Ananiya covered up. That's, that's what these clouds of glory, they teach us a certain amount of emunah. They teach us that everything that we have is based, is based on Hashem, whether we understand it or not. On the one hand, we have our houses, we have our comfortable lives, but then we move out of our houses and we put ourselves to the mercy of the elements. We put ourselves saying that, you know, life isn't as it seems. It's not as stable as it seems. It could disappear in a flash. And here we are and we're putting all our trust in Hashem, hoping that for example, on the first night of Sukkot, not the entire Sukkot just blows away instead of just half of it. 
right? And this is this is what we're doing on the sukkahs, and that's why it says, "Leman yedu that your generation should know. No matter who the generation is, you could say, "Okay, look, you know these people when they left Egypt, they were on a very high level. I mean, they had left you know 210 years of slavery." But they said, we're willing to follow, follow you. They experienced all these miracles, right? I mean, and not only that, but like, what type of choice did they have? You know, you could stay in Egypt, sure, you know, what a life, get killed, that's another option. You know, so, but they, they were on a very high level. How, maybe we're not on such a high level. Maybe we're not on the level of Amuna, right, in order to experience these things. Maybe we don't trust in Hashem as much as we should. So again, it says uh, the Svas Emes, that if you look at the way that the word the word is missing a vav it should be spelled dalit vav which is called malay it's considered a complete word but you could spell it without it in the Torah it writes it without it to tell you so that every generation should know the generations that are full but even the generations that are missing something whoever you are this is a promise that Hashem gives us right? understand I took care of you once I'm going to take care of you again that's what the sukkah is about. That's what the Ananiya Covenant is about. It's Hashem coming down to us, taking care of us. And it's us saying, Hashem, we put our faith inside of you. Gemara tells us that sukkah is equal to all other mitzvahs. Why is it equal to all other mitzvahs? Because what are all the other mitzvahs? What's the basis for every mitzvah? We know the famous story, the famous medrash, that says that Hashem went to each nation of the world. And they said, he said, do you want to accept the Torah? So they came to the first nation. He says, they say, well, what's written in it? He says, it says, don't kill. He said, well, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, that's the way we, that's what we do. We kill. So, we can't accept the Torah. He came to the next one. He says, uh, do you want to accept the Torah? He says, what's written, what's written in it? He says, well, it says, uh, don't steal. I'm sorry, but this way, you know, somebody's got to make a living somehow. Right? So, that must have been Africans, I think. But um, they... Um, so, you know, we, we don't want to accept it. And he went through each, uh, each nation like this. Then he comes to the Jewish nation and he says, do you want to accept the Torah? They said, no problem. Nasim and Ishmael, we'll do it and we'll hear it. It seems to be irresponsible. You know, the other people, they knew, where they, were, they knew what they were lacking. They asked, what's written inside of it? How could the Jewish nation, we claim to be so smart, right? You want to, you know, check out whether it's going to be the best deal we could possibly get, right? And what do they say? No problem. Nasa and Ishmael will do it. Where, where was the responsibility? I think that the answer is, is the fact that based on the past, they understood where they were. They understood that, you know, they just came out, they were a nation of slaves. They understood that, you know, there's a lot to do in their lives. But they had the faith that they could do it. They had the faith in themselves that they could do it. And they had the faith if Hashem is offering it to them, it means that it's something that's possible for them to keep. The other nations that came to Hashem said, do you want to do it? They said, what's written? They said, this is me, I can't change. Right? They didn't have the faith in themselves and they didn't have the faith that Hashem had in them. So if you don't have the faith, if you, didn't, and I don't have, you don't have this trust in Hashem, the creator of the world, the one who had shown outright miracles, if you don't have that, if you don't have that much trust, so then you don't have any place for mitzvahs. The mitzvahs, as much as we have understanding of them, as much as some of them we understand and the other ones we don't understand, as much as maybe some of them benefit us and the other ones we don't see how they benefit us, we do them because we understand that Hashem gave them to us. That's what the meaning, that's what the feeling of, of all the mitzvahs is, 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 is. That's why we do them. Is for, for, to, to strengthen our amunah, that's a basis for it. On the other hand, it also says like this, is that, remember we started off saying that there was a question, was it just clouds of glory, or was it just huts? So I asked the Svas Ames, he says, why was it, why would you have to build huts? If anyway they were going to be having uh, clouds of glory, why would you have to build huts at all? And he says that it's one thing to, to experience a miracle. It's one thing to go out into the desert and, and all of a sudden Hashem protects you. To reach a high level like that is not such a big deal. To understand that is not such a big deal. To go out, to build something yourself, to be involved in the miracle, for a way of putting it down, saying, you know, Hashem, I know that you have the ability to do it, but I'm going to put in my effort also. I'm going to become part of this miracle. He says that's why they have to build huts. 
When we come out, when we go into the sukkah, we put our entire energy into it. We put our entire life into it. We say that Hashem, we understand that there's something not right in our lives and we want to perfect it. We want to push all this other stuff aside and focus on you now. Focus on the relationship, whatever the relationship might be. Right? But let's focus on it for now. And that's what we do. We're involved in it, not just waiting for it to come to us. But we're going to say, Hashem, we're so invested in this that we're going to put into it. So this is Hashem, that's why according to that, to that commentator, it says that, that they also built huts within that on their covenant. He says that's the reason why we have to, why we have to build the, the sukkah. It's because we should be involved within this mitzvah. Why that on their Another reason why, they know that, why, why these cards of glory, as opposed to any other mitzvah, was because, and this is uh, what uh, Rabbi Golsin uh, alluded to, was that clouds of glory came in the merit of Aaron Akon, of Aaron. And what was, what, what was a, Aaron was referred to as a coin, it was an Oyev Shalom, a Rodev Shalom. When we talk about a priest, they, we should be a nation of priests. It means that what does a priest do? The priest is the one that makes Shalom. He makes peace between man and God. He builds that relationship. He bridges the gap that there is between us and God. And here you have Aaron Akoin, and in his merit, right, we had these clouds of glory. Now, what happened was he was involved in this sin of the golden calf. He was the one who didn't instigate it, but he, in a sense, led it. According to one of the commentaries in the Talmud, it says that he led it in order to teach people the power of tshuva. Everybody who was involved was, in, was putting their lives on the line in order to show that you can, no matter how bad you do it, how, bad, how far away you go, how much you commit adultery, that ultimately you could come back and Hashem will accept you back. That's a tremendous thing. Uh, that Gemara obviously needs to be understood. How could they put themselves in that situation? Doesn't mean it was a conscious thing. That's not for now. But ultimately, what the idea of, of, uh, of the clouds of glory were, and the idea of the sukkah, was here they are in the merit of Arana Kohen. He's just supposed to be the one that is bringing us closer to Hashem. And yet, on the other hand, he was partly responsible for the sin of the golden calf, which was a terrible sin. And still you see afterwards that, that Hashem accepted the tshuva of the entire Jewish nation. He accepted it. We have the faith when we go outside. We just finished the Yom Kippur. We finished the Rosh Hashanah. And we're showing Hashem that we understand totally, no matter what, we have this faith in you. We have this faith in Hashem that we'll be able, He'll accept our tshuva. And we're showing Him how much we have this faith. Tonight is Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah, as Rabbi Furman pointed out, is the last stand. Is the last, you know, it's true that it's, we're judged on the water, but it says that the water is the essence of man. Right? If we didn't have water, we wouldn't be able to live. So therefore, in a sense, we're being judged also. And we are being judged. The books are closed tonight. The water, as, he, as Rabbi Goldstein also referred to, is Mayim Chaim, is Torah. Torah is our entire lives. Torah brings us closer to Hashem. I, I heard from, uh, from a certain Lubavitcher rabbi today, I don't remember his name, that's why I said a certain one. He just moved to town and I just met him. But he, uh, he, he, he brought down from the Rebbe that, that he, we, the, the Gemara says that each one of the four minim relate to a different type of Jew. One of the Esog is a Jew that has, that it, because it has tamborech, it has smell and it has taste, so it refers to the, it refers to the Jew that has Torah and, and good deeds, Torah and mitzvahs, etc. Each one is different. I'm sure Rabbi Furman has spoken about it here. But he says that the lulav refers to the person that, it refers to the person that has Torah and doesn't have the mice and Torah. He doesn't have the good deeds. And he explains that that person uh, we tend to look at it as a negative thing in terms of here's this, here's this guy that you know, you're learning and you don't have good deeds, what could it be? But it explains to Rebbe is that if you look at the lulav, the lulav is the largest of all the four minim. It's the tallest one. It's the one that sticks out. Ultimately, the Torah is going to affect everything else. We say, Anatilas lulav, that we take the lulav. We should have said the most complete one would be the Esra. We should have said, uh, um, al, we should have said that we're taking the Esra. Instead, we say we take the lulav. Torah is the basis of life. Torah is a connection to Hashem. Torah is reading Hashem's blueprint to creation. And Hashanah Rabbah, they, they, we're judged on our water, we're judged on our Torah, we're judged on our inspiration. It says that Hashanah Rabbah is on the 21st day of Tishrei. 
And it's, it's marumas, it's hinted to in Hashem's name, where it says when Moshe Rabbeinu came to Hashem, Hashem said, you have to go um, tell the Jewish nation I'm going to take them out. He says, what am I going to tell them? Who, who's like speaking? He says, my name is E Yasha Eya. I will be where I, what I will be. The word E is a gematria, comes out to the numerical value of 21. At Oshana Rabbah, what we concentrate on is the future. We again, we concentrate on the tshuva. We concentrate on that feeling of, of ayah, I will be, I will become something. We do this every year. We keep trying every year to do it and sometimes we don't do it. And he says, that's why the, the Nesim Shalom says this, is that ayah asher ayah. That you're, you're an ayah, you'll be, but you wouldn't be. Asher ayah, so you will be. You have to keep on looking at it. You have to keep on concentrating on it. If you add the two together, ayah, asher ayah, by each other, it comes out to the word ms. It comes out to the word of truth. What you want to be, what you really want to be, is dependent on how much you really want to be. The truthfulness of how you come to it. The emuna that we have, the faith in Hashem, how far does that extend? And so we have our traditions and we go out into the sukkah. But does it extend to the point that we're going to lead our whole lives by it? That we're going to have our faith in business in the same way that we have our faith to go outside and sit in the wind? That we understand that everything in Hashem, everything that Hashem tells us is going to be something is, is really, we, we really have faith in that? That's what Hashanah Rabbah is about. It's a time that we're judged on our feeling. It's a time that we're judged on our amuna. It's a time that after seven days of sitting in the sukkah, of taking the four things, the, the, the four species together, and putting our entire essence into them, of shaking them with all our might, of inviting our forefathers into our sukkah in order to help us relate to who they are. After doing all of these different things, we come to Hashanah Rabbah. It's our last chance before the books are closed. Where are we holding? Where do we really want to be holding? Looking at the sukkah, looking at the Anani HaKavah, looking at the clouds of glory and their relation to us, we see that they're not something that was just back a long time ago, 3,300 years ago. It's something that is Laman Yehdu Derasechem. It's something that is totally appropriate and applicable for every generation from now from back then until now and until all of the future. Mir Hashem, next year, uh, Rabbi Furman's Hashanah Rabbi party should be in Yerushalayim and it should be with everybody, truly underneath Hashem Sukkah.